my name is Janet Bridgers, Executive Director of Earth Alert. We're here with the next in the series, Heroes of the Coast, the program that brings you the personal stories of the people who have dedicated their lives to saving the California coast for the rest of us. And I'm very pleased today to have as our guest, Peter Douglas, Executive Director of the California Coastal Commission. Peter, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Janet. Peter, you've been Executive Director of the California Coastal Commission now for 20 years, correct? And we're ex Deputy Director since? Since uh, January of 1977, mm -hmm. and I've been the Director since June of 1985. So you've spent most of your adult life involved in coastal activities, but for the sake of our story, take us back to the point before you became involved. You, you had graduated from UCLA Law School, correct? I did. What year was that? That was 1969 from law school. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, my then wife and I traveled around uh, Europe and Africa and looking for a place to live and decided that uh, we would come back to the states, California, if we didn't like what we saw, then we could come back and fight for change because this is one of the one of the few places on the earth where you could really make a difference. So we decided to come back and get involved in some activist uh, issues. So you would you uh, already call yourself an environmentalist at that time? An activist. An activist. I was very involved in uh, a number of programs, civil uh, rights issues, fair housing, uh, draft counseling, Indian rights, uh, civil rights um, for inmates in um, law school. So, and I was the chair of a program there for two years, reaching out into the community, working with uh, people who didn't have the means to help them get justice and uh, fairness in our system. It's a lot of issues. A lot of issues. Environment wasn't one of them at that point, though. How did you happen to um, become part of Alan Cerrotti's office? Well, Alan came to speak at uh, UCLA Law School, and I was very impressed with what he had to say. I guess we should tell yeah. everybody what Alan. Alan was, was. He was an assembly man at the time, a member of the state assembly from Beverly Hills, West LA. And he was very involved in a whole number of issues that I cared a lot about, fighting the death penalty, uh, equal treatment for um, immigrants, for consumer rights, prison reform, and the environment. And when I came back from our trip uh, abroad, was looking for work, a friend of mine from law school who worked for Allen called me and said he's looking for somebody to work on the Coastal Act and he'd like to talk to you about it. So we got together for breakfast in Beverly Hills one day and I, I had determined never to go into politics or work in politics. But after a couple hours with Alan, I really liked the guy and I thought this would be a wonderful person to work with. Uh, he's a humanist, smart, not arrogant, not pretentious, and not really political. And because I would be given as a primary task drafting a bill to protect the California coast, I thought this is a job worth pursuing and I did. He hired me and I went to work for him in January, end of January 1971 and the first bill I got on my desk to work on was the Coastal Act. That's like getting started day one on this. Uh, day two, actually. Day two. So there were many, there were several efforts after that to try to get legislation through the state legislature. That's right. We tried, um, as, as you know, the idea for this came from Ellen Stern Harris in 1968. There were several efforts in 1970, but the environmentalists were all over the field. So they f got together in the fall or winter of 70, and they formed the California Coastal Alliance under the leadership of Janet Adams. And the idea was all of these environmental groups would work under this umbrella Coastal Alliance to, put, to support one bill, which Alan Cerrotti introduced in 1971, 
and we got it out of the assembly, but we couldn't get it out of the Senate committee. So the next year came back and tried the same thing. We tried a bill both starting on the Senate side and the assembly side, and the Coastal Alliance made it clear that if these bills failed, they would go to the initiative process. That was already decided. That was decided at the beginning of the 72 session, that if we couldn't get a bill through this year, we were going to go to the people and the initiative process, yes. So since we couldn't get a bill through, the Senate bill died, the Assembly bill made it over to the Senate, but we couldn't get it out there, and then uh, went to the initiative process. And it, it was uh, going very slow, and I remember calling the attorney for the Coastal Alliance saying, Ray, what's going on here? We've, I haven't seen any drafts of the Coastal Initiative. And he said, well, we're not really doing much. I said, how about getting together this Saturday? And so we did. We met in the, his law firm in San Francisco and wrote the initiative in one morning. You did? Yeah. We wrote it in one morning. And, um, and I remember standing up after we finished looking out the window from the 34th floor of uh, his, the high rise where the law firm was said, Ray, we haven't got enough in here for the people. Um, he said, well, what do you suggest? And I said, we, we ought to talk about the coast being a precious, irreplaceable resource belonging to all the people. He said, we can't do that, because if we do that, the court will say we're taking private property, and it'll be challenged and maybe thrown out. And I said, no, they won't. They'll just say this is just a statement of, gee, we wish this were so. Mm -hmm. But so we kept that in. And sure enough, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court interpreted it the way I thought they would interpret it. They did. That it was not an operative expropriation of property. It was just a statement that the coast is something that all the people have a stake in. Anyway, we finished that initiative. I sent it out to about 20 people. Got about two comments back, uh, minor comments, and that's how it was circulated and got on the ballot and passed. And once it passed, uh, well, I was very involved in the campaign. Mm -hmm. How were you involved in the campaign? Well, Alan was great. He um, said it was important for me to be available to go talk about what it does and doesn't do, because there was a lot of misinformation out there. So I wasn't involved in the press. I wasn't involved in the actual rallies, things like that. But I was very involved in television appearances, radio appearances, explaining what it does talking to Rotary Clubs, talking to editorial boards about what the proposed initiative would do, how it would work. And that was the role that I played in the campaign. When we won by 54% of the vote, and I have in my office a headline, two headlines. One is, uh, Nixon wins by landslide over McGovern, and he won by 51%. And then Coastal Initiative squeaks by, and we won by over 54 percent. Were you surprised by the results? Did you know it was? Did, did you have polling that showed it was going to? We had that? polling, and we were way ahead until the last few weeks. And the opposition spent so much money; we were outspent, 10, 20 to one, 20. and it just looked like they were making headway, and they were. Our numbers were going down. I felt good about it, but you never can tell. Um, and it was tense until probably middle of the night when we realized it, it had passed. And then what happened to your life? Then uh, I went back to Alan after celebrating for a few days. And he said, well, what should we do now uh, that this uh, initiative passed and the Coastal Commission is going to be established? I said, well, Alan, I think what we need is a select committee of the legislature that will help in the implementation, in the establishment of the commission. We need to have regulations. We need to have a budget drafted. We need to get people appointed, uh, find office space for them. They have to start. And I think it's important that the legislature have a liaison, a committee, to not only help with that, but also to monitor the implementation of the initiative so that uh, when it uh, the plan for permanent protection of the coast comes back in 1976, we'll have had this ongoing liaison with the Coastal Commission and also to help them do their job during this 
interim uh, temporary period. So we went to the Speaker of the Assembly at that time, Bob Moretti, and said, we really think a select committee would be a good idea. And he didn't hesitate. He said, fine. We established a select committee. Alan was the chair. I became the consultant. And my job was to help implement the initiative. So the first thing I did with working with my counterpart on the Senate side and with the governor's staff. Governor Reagan was, uh, Ronald Reagan was the governor at the time, very opposed to the initiative. But once it passed, he said, the people have spoken. We're going to make it work. So the three of us, the Senate, the Assembly, and the governor's office, sponsored a conference um, or a gathering in Sacramento of all the new commissioners that had just been appointed um, by the end of the year, past November 7th. And by the end of the year, the new commissioners had been appointed. And so we got them together in Sacramento and had prepared a whole outline of things that they needed to do. They needed to organize. They needed to elect a chair and a vice chair. And they had to appoint the regional commissions, had to appoint somebody to the state commission. State commission had to adopt a budget, regulations. So all of that worked over two days in, uh, in Sacramento. Then they, they met, they caucused, and they actually decided when to meet. And so each regional, there were six regional commissions, they each set a date. They then met, selected their chair, and who was going to be on the state commission. The state commission set a date and met. And my job at that point was to work with um, uh, Joe Bodovitz, who was the executive director of the San Francisco Bay Commission, <clears throat> who agreed to help. Mm -hmm. um, so he put together a draft, a proposed budget for the Coastal Commission. We worked on draft regulations. So we had all this prepared for this commission when it first met. And I remember they met, uh, I believe it was, it was in San Francisco. And it was a rainy day, uh, but they met. They um, elected Mel Lane as the chair, Ellen Stern Harris as the vice chair. And they appointed Joe Bodovitz. They said, gee, we need an executive director. And Joe was on loan sitting in the at the table, acting as, as their on loan executive director. <clears throat> and they said, gee, we need an executive director. Joe, would you be interested? He said, well, it just so happens I would. So they had a chair, a vice chair, executive director. And then they adopted the budget that was proposed and the regulations. So they did all that in one meeting. That's amazing. It was an amazing story because there were those people like the realtors, developers, industry who had opposed the Coastal Commission who said, this can never work. It'll never function. It won't happen. Uh, well, we proved them wrong. Not only did they hit the ground running, uh, they were ready to start processing permits in February of 1973, which is when the permit requirements kicked in. And they had office space, and they had staff, and they were ready to go. So, so it was those, pretty those much. Pot permits did start coming right They across. started coming right away. Yes, mm -hmm. they did. And big and we, small. Big and small, and we still have some that we have to live with forever. The bad decisions that fell through the cracks because the commission was so brand new and didn't quite have its feet on the ground yet. But by and large, they were ready to go, and they, they uh, did what a lot of people thought was impossible, getting organized and getting functional and actually starting to protect the coast through this new law. There's a, a, a paragraph that I read that uh, uh, for the sake of viewers who may not have been aware in the 60s, along with uh, an Army Corps of Engineers scheme to fill 60% of San Francisco Bay, the 60s saw plans to expand California's famous Pacific Coast Highway into a multi-lane freeway build hundreds of new homes on what is now Point Reyes National Seashore, construct Miami Beach-style high-rises along the state's central and south coast, drill for oil off Monterey and Big Sur, and install a nuclear power plant on scenic Bodega Bay headlines north of San Francisco. This was all actually in the works when the coastal plans, when the initiative passed. Plans were being put together to uh, develop the coast that way. Lots of new harbors. In fact, many po nuclear power plants were being proposed, not just Bodega Bay. Um, and it was all of these threats to the coast that really 
stimulated people to want to do something. And then, of course, we had the 1969 oil spill in Santa Barbara, which really catalyzed uh, people. And then things happened, like the Sea Ranch development on the Sonoma Coast, where the public all of a sudden lost access to 10 miles of the coast mm -hmm. in the late 60s. Um, you had high-rise buildings go up in Coronado. You had uh, single-family homes in Redondo Beach replaced by humongous uh, con condominium projects. Um, you had a number of the, the Holiday Inn that went in at uh, Monterey, right in the Crescent, on the beach uh, there. There were a number of things that happened that people just looked around and said, my God, is this what the future of our coast holds? And the public support for enacting a coastal law that would be protective uh, long term of the coast was incredible and it was maintained through the whole campaign. And we came out very late with the petitions for Prop 20. It happened that we got them back from the printer on the day before the League of Women Voters held their convention. So we were able to drive literally thousands of these petitions to the convention. Uh, but we gathered the required hundreds of thousands of signatures within five weeks. I mean, it was a short period of time. Nobody thought it could be done. But we got it done because people cared. And we qualified it in time for the November ballot, which was the goal. But it was a very tight time limit. Uh, the public cared. They looked at these plans. Uh, and I mean, the, the filling of San Francisco Bay is what led to the San Francisco Bay Commission in 1965. Um, so that was the stimulus for people to protect the bay. I think the oil spill. The threat of uh, the uh, freeway along the coast, the nuclear plants, the filling in of wetlands, the loss of wetlands, the loss of public access, those were all threats that galvanized the public into taking action themselves to save the coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to have share another half hour where we talk about your some of the highlights of your experience with the commission, but I'd kind of like to fast forward now into the into the future and talk more about um, where where is coastal activism going and where is the the coastal commission going um, what kind of shape is the coastal commission in today well the coastal commission is a unique entity it's an independent commission uh, so it's not controlled by uh, the administration its appointing authority is uh, uh, divided between the Senate and the Assembly and the Governor, a division of authority that was just recently upheld by the California Supreme Court, uh, actually strengthening the Coastal Commission in ways that had not uh, existed before. Did you give you a sense of re relief on? Sen not only a sense of relief, but it also led to fixed terms of appointment for the commissioners. So they're appointed now for four-year terms which is something we tried to get into the Coastal Act in 1976, uh, but we couldn't because the governor at that time, Jerry Brown, and the speaker didn't want that. They wanted to have the flexibility to appoint and remove commissioners at any time. And that happened so a lot. It did happen, uh, too much. But the, uh, so the recent decision by the Supreme Court and the legislature's reaction to the lawsuit and the lower court rulings declaring the commission unconstitutional led to the enactment of a law that fixed the terms of commissioners, which has tremendously strengthened the commission. So I'm grateful to the Marine Forest Society for bringing a lawsuit and doing what the environmentalists couldn't do in the 30 years before. Um, so that was an ironic, unintended consequence, I'm sure, but it certainly has strengthened the commission. I think the fact that the commission continues to maintain such strong public support California Public Policy Institute did a poll two years ago, and the overwhelming majority of people thought that the commission wasn't tough enough. We were allowing too much development. But by and large, they said the Coastal Commission, through, through the Coastal Act, was doing a better job to protect the coast than local government or anyone else. So the public support is there. I think the biggest problem is the funding the support, getting the resources to do the work. Uh, the, we have one biologist to work one on projects, one biologist to work projects having habitat impacts 
the entire 1,100 miles of California coast. That's ridiculous. Uh, we don't have the resources to ha hire another one. Our enforcement program, we had two people up until the Davis administration uh, running the um, uh, enforcement program for the entire state. The, the technical expertise that we need and the resources we need to do our work simply isn't adequate. So to me, the single most important thing we can do to ensure long-term protection of the coast and ocean is to find a permanent, stable, adequate source of funding. We failed to get that into the Coastal Act in 1976, and that was probably one of our biggest um, failings at the time. I think the commission right now is one of the best commissions we've had. We've got a terrific chair. We've got a good membership. Um, we have people who believe in the law and who do their homework. Uh, and we continue to have that factor that really has made it work, and that is public support. Uh, one of the hallmarks of the Coastal Act was public participation, public involvement. I think when you talk to people who are involved with other state agencies or federal agencies or even local government, I think you'll find agreement that the Coastal Commission is the most accessible and the most open and the most encouraging of public involvement. And when people ask me what, uh, what are some of the major accomplishments of the Coastal Commission, I point to the empowerment of citizens to become actively involved in the future of their community, uh, their region, their state, uh, by getting involved in some form of coastal conservation or environmental stewardship and staying involved, and that they can make a difference. And people who have come to the Coastal Commission who weren't listened to or shut off at the local government level or some other state agency, have gone away from the Coastal Commission saying, boy, they listened to us. We made a difference. And that energized them to form more, to form active groups in their communities and to get involved and stay involved. Um, activism, public involvement is key. That's what made the Coastal Act happen. That's why I call it the people's law. Uh, and it's what sustained it. Every time there's been a challenge or an attack on it, it's the public that's come step forward to defend it. Uh, so public activism and involvement is a key. Uh, and right now, uh, that's still at a high level, but it needs to be higher. Unfortunately, it costs money to be involved. We meet up and down the, the state. Uh, it takes resources to understand the complexity of the issues. It's hard to sustain that level of involvement that really is necessary. Uh, but we do get it uh, on spe in specific areas. Um, I just think it's one of the most important elements of coastal protection because the coast is never saved. No. It's, it's always being saved. And you know, when you think you've finished uh, and saved a particular reach of the coast, next by making a park out of it, for example, next thing you know, there's a proposal to have off-highway vehicles running around on it, or put roads in areas that are highly sensitive, uh, or campgrounds into habitat, sensitive habitat. So there has to be constant vigilance and constant involvement. That's why public activism is the key to the future of, uh, of any reach of environment that's coveted by developers and those who would, who would use it for profit, private profit. Um. You have, this has become, the Coastal Act has become a model for bills in other countries as well. Yes, it has. And I've been to other countries um, as an um, invitee to help them uh, shape a coastal protection program for themselves. I've been to Chile. Uh, we worked with the Navy there and the government um, to try to put together a coastal protection program for them. They have a coast very much similar to California's. I've been to China. I've worked with uh, people, delegations from uh, Vietnam, from Sri Lanka, uh, from uh, Europe, different coastal European countries um, who, and Australia, uh, who want to protect their coast and have looked to the California Coastal Act as a model that they can either emulate or at least take some parts from that, uh, that might serve them well. I know when we were in China, 
um, our counterparts, uh, after reading the act, asked me, what is this about public participation? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, we have these public hearings, and, all that. and they said, no, 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 we don't need that. We, we do that. <laughs> and what is this commission? So I explained that to them. They said, no, 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 no. we make the decisions. We'll, we'll do that. We, we don't need a commission. So there is still a little ways behind There is a ways to go. <laughs> but but um, we're in the last uh, couple minutes of the program. Uh, there is a phrase I read that you described yourself with, and if you could uh, give us a little more insight into that. You said you, you called yourself an optimistic pessimist. An optimistic pessi pessimist? Uh -huh. I did, did I? Yes. Uh -huh. I <laughs> don't remember like that. <laughs> I thought you were going to use the phrase radical pagan heretic. Well, that's, that if you prefer to that that's, one. That's <laughs> what I call myself, because <laughs> radical means getting to the root of issues. Mm -hmm. And pagan uh, refers to those who have a reverence for nature and that which we don't understand in the universe. And I certainly consider myself as someone who has that sort of reverence. And then heretic, it means to choose. To choose. And I think choose is one of the greatest gifts that we have the ability to choose what we do, what we don't do, where we get involved and where we don't. And that comes from Constantine deciding in 333 that Catholicism would be the religion of the empire and that those who chose not to follow that path were heretics. They chose poorly. Well, I think choosing is a gift that we have, so I don't mind being called a heretic. Peter, it's been wonderful to have you. And uh, thank you for all of your work, for all of these years. Visitors, thank you for joining us. We hope you'll stay tuned, uh, come back to see the next episode of Heroes of the Coast.